The text today is Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. I'm not going to read it right now. I encourage you to pause the video and read that yourself. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and the record of the genealogy of, of Jesus, your Son. I pray that through these words, that, that your Son would be glorified in our hearts, that we would begin to see how great and how magnificent he is, and that we would live our lives for you and for him. Amen. Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, beginning a series on Matthew now, on Matthew's Gospel. Uh, it's the first book of the New Testament, as you probably know, and it's just good to kind of experience what it's like, you know, turning the page from the last chapter of Malachi to, um, well, I got a little thing in between here, to the first page of the New Testament, and that represents about at least 430 years of silence, of, of God the Spirit not giving any prophets or apostles words to speak. But as we read verse 1, we see that it's really clear that Matthew is continuing the same story that was recorded in the Old Testament by Moses and the prophets. Because Matthew 1 verse 1 says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, I, there are three connections, three Two of them very clear, a third a little bit more elusive. Three connections to the Old Testament in that very first verse. Um, the first one is the one that's a little bit more elusive, and I maybe we, we didn't notice it. I didn't notice it right away. But it's the phrase, the book of the genealogy. What I learned was that that phrase, the book of the genealogy, or you could translate it the book of the origin or even the book of Genesis. Um, that exact phrase with those exact words are used in the Greek version of the Old Testament. Uh, of course, Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but the Greek version was very popular in you know, Matthew's day. Uh, he likely had a copy or, or had access to a copy. And he used that same phrase that was used in Genesis 2-4 and Genesis 5-1. Genesis 2.4 has, it translates it this way, the book of Genesis of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Okay, so that's the same phrase used. And then in 5.1, the book of Genesis of Adam. And, and Matthew is using the same Greek words when he begins, uh, you know, his gospel. You, you could translate it, the book of Genesis of Jesus Christ. And Matthew had to have done this intentionally and using the same phrase in his gospel to open his gospel that he found in Genesis 2, 4 and 5, 1. So what does this imply? What does this signal? It shows that just as the first book of the Old Covenant opened with the account of Genesis or the account of creation, so also the first book of the New Covenant is also giving an account of the new creation, the new Genesis that God is now accomplishing in his Son. In Jesus, there is a new beginning, a new Genesis. One author put it this way, <clears throat> Jesus, the last Adam, has come to reverse the effects of the first Adam's transgression and establish the new age. Now this is taught clearly in like Romans 5, but here it's symbolically alluded to just by the use of that phrase, uh, the book of, of the Genesis or of the genealogy. And so that's the first connection to the Old Testament found in the first phrase of the New Testament. The next connection is in uh, the way that Jesus is described. He, he is called Jesus Christ, the son of David. Now these are two titles. Uh, the first title is Christ. It, Christ is not his last name. It's a title. Uh, it means Messiah. It means anointed one. Now in the Old Testament, the, the people who were anointed were kings. Like when uh, God told Samuel to make Saul the king, he anointed him with oil. He did the same thing when David became king. Priests were also anointed when they became high priests. But, but apart from just anointed one, the term Christ or Messiah came to kind of have a, a more delineated meaning. Um, one author says that the term referred to the long-awaited deliverer of God's people 
whose coming the prophets had foretold. Okay, that's a good summary description. The Christ is not only God's anointed king, he is the one who is going to deliver his people, the one that the prophets were looking forward uh, to, that, that his coming would mean salvation for God's people. Now, the Christ is also <clears throat> the son of David. The son of David is the second title used for Jesus in verse 1. Um, there's a lot of overlap in meaning between Christ and son of David. They're, they're almost interchangeable. Now, David, of course, was Israel's greatest king. And God promised David in 2 Samuel 7 that one of his offspring would rule and that he would establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And there are many promises in the Old Testament about the son of David and about what God would do through the son of David for his people. I'm just going to share one passage from Jeremiah 23, where God says, I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. <clears throat> in his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And so really good things will happen when this son of David comes to power. Um, he is a righteous king. He is going to save his people, God's people and deliver them and keep them safe. Um, the way he's going to rule will be a good rule. He's going to execute justice and righteousness in the land. And so to sum it all up, the son of David, he's going to deliver God's people and he's going to set the world right. Now, the third title used for Jesus in Matthew 1.1 is Son of Abraham. I guess it's not so much a title, just as a description. He is a descendant or a son of Abraham. And that harkens back to the main character uh, of Genesis, starting at Genesis 12, where God uh, you know, called him out of his land and, and said, Abraham, go to the place I'll show you. And he made him these wonderful promises. And I can't even repeat all of them. There's so many. But one of them is this. Abraham, in you and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And so it's fitting that uh, Jesus is an offspring of Abraham because God promised a universal blessing through an offspring of Abraham. I won't say anything more about Abraham, although there's much to be said. Uh, so all I want to say now is that with verse 1, Matthew is showing us that he is continuing the Old Testament storyline. Even more than just continuing, like another, like another book um, in the same vein, I think Matthew is signaling that, that with the coming of Jesus, with his birth, God is now fulfilling his promises that he had been making throughout the Old Testament. And so that's my point of verse 1, that there are these three vital connections to the Old Testament story that are hinting towards fulfillment. Now my next point, point 2, is from verse 17. And, and what was maybe hinted at in verse 1 is more obvious when you look at 17, that Jesus is the climax and fulfillment of history. We'll read verse 17. This is how Matthew ends his genealogy. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the de deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Okay, so the number 14 is a big deal to Matthew here. Uh, that's how he has structured his genealogy. Um, in the Bible, it's pretty obvious that the number seven is an important number. Seven usually signals uh, completeness. And 14 is twice seven, two times seven. And so you got twice seven, and you've got twice seven three times. And I think it doesn't take a rocket scientist to recognize that Matthew is showing us that there is complete completeness. Now, now with the coming of Jesus, everything is now made complete. Others have noticed uh, that the number 14 is the numerical value of the name David. Now, the Hebrew rabbis assigned a numerical value to every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so you could, you could say, you know, this name or this word equals this number. And we don't do it today, but I guess it was kind of popular in, in Jesus' day. And they, they notice that the number 14 is the numerical value for the name David. And that might be significant. That might be the reason why 
um, Matthew highlights that number. Uh, we can't say for sure. But at the very least, we can see that from the way that Matthew has structured his genealogy and to the way he points it out and organizes it for us in verse 17, that there is a beautiful symmetry to this genealogy. There is a sense of complete completeness and finality now with the birth of Jesus Christ. Um, apart from that, we can just look at the structure and say that this is beautiful. This, this is just fitting, and it seems right, right, to, to, to look at it all coming together like this and concluding with the, with the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, from verse 17, Matthew, uh, he mentions these three turning points in history as he records it. There's, there's from Abraham. He starts with Abraham, but the first turning point is the ascension of King David. Okay, that is the high point in Israel's Old Testament history. When, when King David went to the throne and when they acquired all the land that God had promised them. Um, but then the next, at 14 generations later, we have the deportation or exile to Babylon. And that is the low point that God's people uh, experience. Because of their continued uh, idolatry and sin without repentance, God finally destroyed their nation, destroyed their temple, and had them shipped out all over the place, uh, primarily to Babylon. So that's the low point. And then the next turning point, 14 generations later, is the birth of the Christ. And what this signals, I think, is that now, now, now God is going to rescue us from that low point. And you might say, well, they weren't in Babylon anymore. And, and, and yeah, true, even though a lot of the Israelites we're back in the promised land, in the land of Israel, and Babylon was no longer a power, although Rome was. Rome had power over them. Um, things were still not right. Things were still not as they ought to be for God's people. And we see this, for instance, in Luke 2, um, in the account of Jesus' birth, when we meet Simeon. And it says that Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, why would he be waiting for the consolation of Israel if everything was hunky-dory and, and if everything was as the prophet said it would be? No, they weren't. Uh, likewise, in Luke 2, Anna was a prophetess in the temple, and she was speaking uh, to all who were coming to the temple. She was speaking uh, to those who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So in this time between the writing of Malachi and the writing of Matthew, even before the birth of Jesus, they were still waiting for redemption. They, they weren't in Babylon anymore, but they were still in exile. They were still in bondage. And this is made most clearly for us in Matthew 1, 21, when the angel tells Joseph to name his son Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That's the bondage that God's people ultimately needed to be rescued from, the bondage of their own sin. And that's why the birth of Jesus is the third and climactic turning point in history as Matthew records it in the, this genealogy. Right now, the Christ, the son of David, has come, and he is the one who will rescue us and deliver us from our bondage to sin. Matthew uses this threefold structure of his genealogy to show us that Jesus is the high point of all history and that all things have led up to him. He is the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham and to David. In fact, that first phrase even suggests that God is beginning a new creation, a new Genesis with the birth of Jesus Christ. In short, Jesus is the climax and fulfillment of all history. Now, we often ignore genealogies or get bogged down and kind of lost in the details, but it's really neat if we just step back and look at the big picture. Even if we just look at the first and last verse of this genealogy, if we do that and pay attention to, to what Matthew is, is, is teaching us, we can discern the big idea that Matthew wants us to get across. And it is a foundational idea. It's a foundational teaching, namely that Jesus is the center. He is the climax and fulfillment of all things. So now that you have seen this, and that's the end of point two, we're on to point three now. Now that you have seen this, what's the point? How does it apply to our lives? Well, let me illustrate uh, with a story from when I was a kid playing baseball, probably about fifth grade or so. Um, now, there was a kid named Henry, and I'm changing his name in case he's listening. And I'm changing some of the details so it fits with this story a little bit better. But 
the basic scheme of the story really happened. There was a boy named Henry, and he was a right fielder. I was a left fielder. And um, playing in the outfield when you're kids can be a little boring. You don't get a lot of action. And even I got tempted to be distracted from time to time. But not like Henry. Henry is what we would call a zoomer. He was off in his own little world half the time, or maybe even most of the time. He was out, I don't know, fighting dragons or um, conquering, I don't know what he was doing in La La Land, but that Henry was a zoomer. And sure enough, uh, we're playing a baseball game against a legitimate team, you know, from another town, and, and, and the ball goes into right field. And, and Henry, he's off fighting dragons, right? He has no idea. And the ball lands like five feet behind him. Would have been an easy catch if he had only been paying attention. And we all yell at him, Henry, Henry, get the ball. Henry looks up and he doesn't even know where to look. He doesn't know where to look uh, to his left, to his right, in front of him or behind him. So, of course, the center fielder is the one who has to go and run and pick up the ball, probably rolling near the fence now. And what should have been... an an easy out, and even if he didn't catch it, what should have been a single, turned into like a double or a triple, okay? And of course, you know, next time we had to, to go in, uh, Henry didn't come out in the outfield. He got to sit on the bench for the rest of the game, right? Um, guys, the, the rest of us who weren't Henry, we kept our eyes on the ball, and, and we reacted to what was happening to the ball. It was the movement of the ball that would determine, um, you know, my movements as a left fielder, whether I stepped back, went ahead, went to the right or to the left. Everything was focused on the ball. Okay, in, in the same way, if Jesus is the center and climax and fulfillment of all history, of all things, we need to pay attention to him. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus and, and base our movements around him, make our decisions based on what Jesus has said in his word, based on the fact that he's the center of history, he died and rose, and he is coming again. He is the center. Now the problem is, today, is that there are a lot of Henrys, okay? In baseball, Henry was the only Henry, okay? And the rest of us, we kind of kept each other accountable. We didn't want to be caught off guard. But today, there are lots of Henrys in the world. Sadly, there's lots of Henrys who even go to church. And so we can begin to think it's kind of normal to be off doing your own thing, not paying attention to Jesus, not listening to his word, not basing your whole life around him. Okay, that's why we need, well, we need a few things. First of all, we need the word. We need, to, we need to keep hearing Jesus' word, his teaching. We need to center ourselves on what Jesus has said, taught, and what he has done for us and for our salvation. And secondly, we need each other. We need to surround ourselves um, with other people who are keeping their eyes on Jesus, who are basing their movements, their decisions, and their whole lives around Jesus. And that will help keep us in line. That will encourage us. And which is which is a big reason why for the next year or so, we're going to be studying Matthew's gospel. Because in every single chapter, in every single story, Matthew is giving us the very words and teaching of Jesus. He is giving us the deeds of Jesus. We will learn who Jesus is. We'll learn what he taught and we'll learn what he has done for us, and we will learn what it looks like to center our lives around him. We'll learn what it looks like to follow him. Let me share with you uh, with uh, the end of history, what, where all of history is heading toward. If Jesus is the center, it only makes sense that he has a big thing to do with the end of history. From Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We see that Jesus is, he, he is Lord. And the appropriate response is to uh, bow our knees in allegiance to him and to confess that he is Lord. And friends, instead of being forced to realize this at the very end of history, when it's obvious, when he comes with glory and with his angels to judge the living and the dead, I invite you to recognize this truth today and to give your complete and total allegiance to Jesus Christ, for he is Lord and he is King. Amen.